today, uh, myself, I'm Amy Chung, Vice President from Satara. I uh, will share with you pediatric drug development presentation together with Dr. Julie Bullock, a Senior Vice President from Satara, to share with you Project Optimus on transforming oncology drug development with you. In, uh, in our work, uh, we have created many integrated practice areas to harness and elevate different disparities to deliver and parallel support to our partners to uh, help you to reach your goal. And pediatrics is one of them within this uh, IP8. And we also have many other uh, areas such as complex biologics, rare disease, MBMA that we collaborate with each other to deliver what we can help with uh, optimizing clinical trial and deliver uh, drugs faster for patients. So pediatric is a multidisciplinary uh, area. And then as you can see from this slide, there are many different areas from toxicologies, juvenile toxicology, clinical pharmacology, regulatory uh, consideration, CMC, modeling and simulation, and clinical operation. And also uh, with recent year that we focus also a lot of how can we use real world data and evidence to support uh, pediatric drug development as well. And this is the outline of what I'm trying to share with you today of what is a special population, why we study them, why we need to study them, and what's the challenge and opportunity in clinical development, and then give you some really high level understanding of the regulatory landscape and what kind of industry supports you have. And then we'll share with you an example of how to apply uh, MIDD uh, to advance the development of a particular compounds and then finally going to share with you some final reads. So here are some definitions because we always hear a lot of MID free, MIDD. They're the same thing. How can we use a model to inform the approach and quantitatively utilizing all the existing information to help us to make predictions and analyzing our data and impact to the trial design and actually finally helping justification of the dose that we're giving to the patients. And another word that uh, often people don't understand it's ontology, very important for pediatrics because that describes the development of an individuals. You might also hear about maturation as well. So that also is a common terms that we used. So what do we mean by subpopulations that you can hear? So subpopulations, we can differentiate between uh, considering about age differences or organ dysfunction in age. Um, they are elderly and pediatric in a very big uh, category. And then for organ dysfunction, you've got renal impairment and hepatic impairment. So in here, we will focus on pediatrics. And the main important things to consider is the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics. We need to understand that very thoroughly because we want to limit the potential over and under dosing to uh, these populations because this will really impact on the dose safety and efficacy. So why do we want to study pediatric? Because we want to ensure all the children receive the treatment that is safe and efficacious, the same as all populations. So um, you can see two roots. If we do study the pediatric population, we can understand what those and schedules would be required for safety and efficacy, and we will meet the regulatory expectations and we can put claims uh, uh, towards our label. But then if we don't do it, we don't understand the safety and efficacy, we can justify from a regulatory perspective, we will need to exclude that in the label. Um, that can also have a great impact. We don't study pediatrics as well in including the impact for the all four submissions planned uh, in the adult uh, indication if there is one. So here's just illustrating in a normal reveal from the Office of Clinical Pharmacology that uh, shown in here. So I highlighted some of the aspects that you can see there's many parts that do consider how the body handles PK and how safety tolerability uh, to justify it in population, et cetera. And then this literature on the right in here, if this kind of information not be understood properly, there will be induced additional consideration after approval to adjust the dose based due to like a PKPD findings. 
There are many uh, regulatory guidance our regulators provided us to support us on the pediatric development. You can see uh, they're from US, from Europe, China, and ICH. Um, not only for uh, a particular age and also for a particular disease area as well. Uh, in FDA, there's also a question uh, base uh, reveal that often ask question related to pediatric, for example, what dosage schedules and adjustment that require for this specific group? And can you justify this dose based on exposure response relationship as well? So pediatric is not small adults uh, because the body compositions are very different, like weight, height, and the organ functions, and then the size are very different as well. In addition for pharmacokinetic, the ADME process are very different. There are maturations that you can see in this uh, very famous literature um, in New England Journal of Medicine to show you the maturations of different enzymes uh, capacity. And then for example, the differences of the body water, body fat uh, changes over time and how long it would take to reach to the adult level. All of this is very important for us when we're designing uh, a compound and also how, what kind of information that we will need and also consideration for modeling as well. And in addition to PK, that's also for PD as well because we need to think about the receptor response, how, how the maturation is impacting them, both on the PD and also safety. Pediatric also defined that we need to group them into different groups. So you can in here, you can see there's classifications of different category from preterms, infants, children to adolescents. But then there are actually differences in previous guidance on how the classification, even though the, the differences is quite minor, um, but sometimes it can be confusing. So in the recent ICH E11, uh, uh, addendum. So they have now uh, asked everyone to consider the age classifications should be a guidance only, but then you should consider per drug and disease, how would the age actually classification to be, what would be the impact uh, rather than just using this numerical cutoff uh, straight out from the table. Uh, in addition to age and PKPD, from a clinical perspective, there are lots of limitation and opportunity you want to um, focus. For example, before we start a trial, we need to understand what do we want to learn from it? How many clinical pharmacology questions we have? Do we understand the safety and efficacy in these uh, populations? What kind of measurements can we make? Uh, because in pediatric population, we're always limited by the total blood foliar limitation uh, due to age and also weight. And then logistically, do we have uh, age appropriate formulations? How would the prevalence of the disease, impact on the recruitment, et cetera. And as mentioned, the volume and the number of the blood sample um, is always a concern and there are equations to help to calculate it, um, the, the total volume needed for the PK and PD, et cetera. And additions, in order to sometimes save the sample, we can consider small sampling techniques, but then again, with that, we need to um, verify the bioanalytical techniques that can help, that can use to uh, analyze those small sample because it needs to be validated. And then we also can consider an optimal sampling scheme or a more innovative approach by having subsets of patients having certain time points, time windowed. And for the dose range, we can extrapolate it with existing data from adults or older uh, pediatric patients data like adolescents to lower age. And then we can use PBPK modeling that taking into account of maturations function and togeny as well. So as mentioned before, we do need to find age appropriate uh, formulations for pediatric and this EMA reflection paper, I'll outline it and summarize very good overview of in what age, uh, what kind of uh, formulation is appropriate, for example, in preborn, neonates, even to infants up to 28 days, it is not feasible to have 
oral tablet formulations because it's not possible to ask a small small baby to swallow tablets. And then there are also different considerations in terms of safety if we are thinking about uh, the constitutions of the oral or different medium, even for the injectable, there's different consideration at different age as well. So now uh, I go back again, why we want to study pediatric and who encourages it. So in order to uh, encourage uh, sponsors uh, to um, consider pediatric drug development, the pediatric plans are mandatory for new drug applications. So in Europe, our pediatric investigation plan PIP is expected and US uh, initial pediatric study plan IPSP is expected as well. So of course, there are more uh, details consideration whether once you set up the plan, whether there you have can provide justification to waive certain age group because that maybe that disease is not um, prevalence in a particular age. Maybe you need to deferral because you need to collect more safety data and understanding in adults before you go into as well. And there are still some uh, regulatory incentive and obligations for that, and which I can show you a very, very high level timeline on when the PIP will need to be um, submitted uh, in order to have, and then the PIP will need to be agreed before you can uh, submit the MAA. And then a really critical part is we do have to have a compliance check for the pediatric data or the commitment that outlined it in the PIP. And then for the IPSP is expected to be discussed at the end of phase two, our discussions with the regulator. And then there is also written requests could be issued by uh, BPCA as well to, to uh, different sponsors for certain development of unmet need. So here's our line for um, ICHE11 guidance and the ICHE11 R1 to very focus on the use of modeling and simulation and the use of extrapolation to enhance pediatric drug development. And then here is just like more details of I cropped it out from the guidance uh, for you to consider. It. And please notice that there is now also ICH extrapolation and MIDD groups to focus on this area. And here are also examples from the industry of how can we de uh, develop collaboratively, collaboratively for pediatric uh, uh, drug development. For example, we look at how can we have an optimal pediatric group and what kind of structure existed in industry in this paper. And in addition, we also have a um, joint uh, companies group within the ICL consortium uh, for PBPK, for pediatric, and then for drug formulation group as well to look at this. And recently, uh, extrapolation is a very hot topic because this is very important tools to make use of the existing information. And because if we, um, if the disease that we looked at between the adult and the pediatric form uh, populations is similar enough, we could actually use the existing data we have and extrapolate to the pediatric uh, trial, either replacing the whole study or part of the study that we only need to collect the PK information in the pediatric trial. And because we can assume that we can extrapolate the efficacy by matching the exposures from the two population. And in this publication from the IQ Consortium, that it can outline a field examples and also that matched it to the guideline um, from the EMA. Uh, on the extrapolation thinking, and there's a poster as well. And then if you want a copy that you cannot retrieve in this link, we can share it with you as well. And I also want to share with you that many times we think, okay, in pediatric development, we probably need to do a very mechanistic approach, but that's not completely correct because it's depending on what is the objective and key question we want to answer from the pediatric development. If we have like really, really young populations, there is a lot of maturations process involved, then of course we would 
be really strongly to consider using a physiological based pharmacokinetic model that we can include those considerations. But at the same time, using the population uh, PK approach that allowed us to pull all the sparse information uh, to this, uh, and to analyze that, and then it allowed us for uh, simulations as well. But it really, really depending on what kind of questions we have to choose which type of models, or sometimes we might need to use both of them to answer all the key questions. And this is just like um, examples of different commercial software that uh, with uh, PVPK with build everything that incorporates a lot of demographic physiological ontogeny and uh, non-clinical information and some of the software for example like uh, some SIP that is specific pediatric populations that is inbuilt uh, that you can uh, use as well. So for the dose selections, it's really key for pediatric that we need to consider, as mentioned, the different size, maturations, how is it different to the efficacy and safety endpoints, and how is difference of the disease progression still to age. So this will be needed to incorporate uh, as you're gathering more information in the development program. And uh, now I'm going to show you one of the example that considering pediatric from the MID3 white paper, and then you can either read the paper or you can listen to the podcast. And it included some definitions of the pediatric in the white paper. Um, and here is outlining the tools that from the white paper from MIDD that we could uh, apply it. For example, we can ask different types of key questions from disease compound and mechanism level, and then divide it into different theme, whether it's on PK efficacy, benefit risk. And then we can set different assumptions uh, because we, when we go into a new population, there is a lot of unknown, and then we can set the assumption, and then how we're going to test this assumption and evaluate them when we're having emerging information. And after that, we can choose the types of modeling that require to answer this question and also validate these assumptions. And finally, sometimes it's good to assess like what's the impact level of um, how the MIDD impact to the program. So this is just some uh, example of how uh, we can ask, for example, PK from a disease level is what is the impact of the disease of the ADME processes in children? And then we could use activities such as PVPK models might be needed to include uh, some ontogeny and physiological changes uh, elements to allow us to assess the differences in the ADME process between the populations and then subsequently understand the disease level. And here is the, in the white paper, we have a hundred examples gathered and out of eight of them is pediatric. And here is the table that summarize what disease uh, was it looking at and what were the compound and what stage of development did it impact? So the example that I want to share with you in here is an example that helped to provide evidence and justify the dose uh, response in the population. So this is a drug called uh, Sinatophil. So it's for a rare indication called pulmonary arterial hypertension. So at the time uh, when this example was presented, uh, in the adult, it was approved it, uh, based on six minutes walking distance data. And there were data from adults for PK and six minutes walking distance, hemodynamic data, and pulmonary uh, vascular resistance index, PVRI data. And then there are also a limited pediatric trial that um, have data for peak oxygen consumption, PVO2. Uh, six minutes walking distance is not feasible in younger patients, unfortunately, because if you imagine it's not possible for like for one year old to walk six minutes in a straight line and then assess it. Um, but then it still have like PVLR uh, collected as a secondary endpoints. So there's already a model developed for adults, but then the aim is to how can we assess synodophil efficacy, dose selection in children, and can we uh, claim the label in children with PAH based on all the available data now 
at that stage for children and adults without the need of uh, initiating a new study. So the assumptions that needed to be made uh, for this uh, exercise is Remember, we talk about like disease similarity is to assuming that the disease relationship between uh, adults and pediatric are similar. So it would allow us to bridge between the two population. This is testable because we can just comparing the existing adult and pediatric data. And in here, you can see two plots. And then the plot on the left is the work uh, from FDA model. And then on the right is the model provided by the sponsor to look at the relationship between PVRI with the peak oxygen biomarker and the six minutes walking distance. So by compare, comparing uh, the two uh, modeling and the results, you can see that the data are consistent between the adult and also the pediatrics from the studies and also is consistent with the finding from uh, the regulatory models. So we can then conclude that, that you, we can use uh, PV, the oxygen a biomarker as a surrogate to the six minutes walking distance. And using that to build models that it can provide assimilations of how different are the dose level comparing with adults and pediatric and setting the dose. And then you can see from the curve in this two plot, there is similar exposure response relationship in adults and children for PVRI as well. So this example is very impactful because it provides the regulatory agency sufficient evidence to support the dose recommendation and it have quite high impact from a regulatory perspective as well because a new study is basically not needed and we can utilize all the information. So finally, I wanna share with you some key considerations. Uh, MRIDD uh, is essential for pediatric uh, drug discovery and development. Um, in the different pediatric examples, although I only show one, that shows you the importance of uh, setting key questions, assumptions, and modeling approach. And always good to evaluate what kind of impact so you can create learning and then so you can see what you need to change next time for a similar example. And also utilizing PBPK modeling will allow us to integrate um, many existing informations from preclinical to clinical, from adult and pediatrics, and allowed us to incorporating uh, ontology and system and physiological data. Uh, PIP is required um, to share like model and simulation plan as well. So it's really good to plan early as, as early as you can during the adult program. And because all of this will allow us to make a quantitative decision making that helped internally from a sponsor's perspective and also externally from a regulatory perspective. And then ultimately, we hope to have better experimental design and also omit unnecessary clinical trials and sample drawn in children. And we can collect better quality of data to improve understanding of the mechanism. And all of this work ultimately can also build on for compound with similar class as well. And here's some like additional read that you could uh, tap into. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have more questions, you can reach out to me at this email and you can also find me on LinkedIn. And now that I want to pass uh, the floor to Julie to share with you on Project Optimus. And thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm here today to discuss with you <clears throat> Project Optimus and how it's been transforming oncology drug development. As stated previously, I'm Julie Bullock. I'm the clinical pharmacology head here at Sertara. So today I will briefly go through a general overview of Project Optimus. Uh, go, what it's aiming to achieve, why now, and some key areas of evidence for the proposed dose that you'll need to consider in your development program. And I'll also go over some new aspects that we have to consider as we are um, navigating this new paradigm uh, and where Project Optimus is impacting development. So Project Optimus uh, is an initiative by the Food and Drug Administration that is reforming dose optimization and dose selection paradigm in oncology. 
Uh, it was launched officially in 2022 um, in February, I believe, and the website is at the bottom of my slides, and you can visit that site to find a list of publications as well as guidance documents that the FDA recommends to address dose optimization for oncology drugs. Um, we have a new guidance that came out in January of this year uh, that provides an initial framework for how to approach optimization of dose in oncology. However, it's relatively general um, as uh, I would expect it to be. Um, and, you know, but it does provide some overarching guiding principles for uh, different approaches that we can use. So what is Project Optimus trying to achieve? So here on the left side of our screen, we see a graph that is somewhat characteristic of what we would expect from a cytotoxic drug. As we increase dose or exposure, we would expect some increase in efficacy, which is the yellow lines in this graph. And with that, we would expect also an increase in toxicity. Uh, however, as we've moved to the, the targeted agent paradigm, uh, what we're seeing as we increase dose or exposure is a relative flattening of the efficacy as we hit our, and saturate our targets. But what we end up seeing in this instance is an increase in the safety or the adverse events with no commensurate benefit in the efficacy. So, you know, the FDA is really just wanting us to collect more information across a a wide variety of doses, ideally, or at least a dose range, more than one, um, to see whether or not we are we have commensurate increases in efficacy that are worth the benefit um, for the the toxicity that we're seeing, or if we could potentially lower the dose, get the same amount of efficacy, and maybe improve tolerability for our patients. Um, this is a fundamental change for how we have approached oncology drug development and oncology dosing. And so it is going to impact uh, development. And, you know, we'll talk about how it's going to do that in, in, the, next, in the later slides. So why now? Um, you know, the state of the current landscape, I think, has pushed the FDA to develop a more formal approach with regards to dose and dose optimization for oncology drugs. So this topic has been around since 2015. Uh, there was a number of FDA AACR web workshops that were held in both 2015, 16, and 17. And in addition to those workshops, there are numerous publications that came out of each of these. Um, however, the use of the MTD approach is still incredibly predominant in oncology. It is the main approach for justification of doses to look at safety alone. Um, this is, uh, you know, leading to an increased uh, scrutiny of the fact that doses are often not tolerated long term. They're requiring dose modifications, including lots of reductions and lots of holidays. Um, and of course, the impact of these dose modifications are not uh, well understood as their impact to efficacy. But we have seen some instances where the adverse events definitely overshadow the efficacy benefit when we've moved into randomized contro controlled trials with active comparators. In addition, I think the agency has learned over time that the post-marketing setting is really not a great place to optimize dose because um, since most of our drugs have been developed using a single arm accelerated approval approach, um, those confirmatory studies uh, if we haven't optimized the dose before approval, are often going to be conducted at uh, doses that haven't been optimized as well. And so if we have an ongoing confirmatory study as well as an ongoing dose optimization study, um, that is definitely going to be a problem and, and it can lead to discordant results. Uh, in addition, by not optimizing prior to approval, it, there is the instances where doses have been placed on the market and have been used for many, many years before we actually understand uh, what the benefit risk is and how to potentially optimize the dose for the patient. So by doing this and moving it earlier into development, the FDA is hoping to avoid some of these pitfalls. So the agency is looking at four key areas to support the proposed dose. And I don't expect you to read every single one of these points on this slide, 
Um, this uh, table was extracted from a Friends of Cancer Research white paper that was published in 2001 on the topic of dosing in oncology. Um, but what I wanted to get out of this is to just show you that it's not just efficacy and safety alone that's going to be deciding the dose for oncology drugs, but it is uh, translational as well as pharmacokinetic. And of course, in each one of these spaces, there is the expectation that we have an understanding of either dose response or exposure response for safety and efficacy and pharmacodynamics if possible. So again, uh, this is an example approach of how you could potentially visualize and use, um, you know, weighted kind of heat map-like approaches uh, with regards to um, different dose levels and these different uh, key factors that we now have to, to balance uh, for our assets. Um, so typically in the old days, uh, we would choose a dose based entirely on safety. And now we have to consider efficacy, pharmacokinetics, dynamics, PK, as well as translational um, into our overall um, justification. And you could even drill down a little bit farther with some of these um, as well is that it's not just whether or not your drug provides a response, but also you could think about looking at time to response. Um, the differences in that might be uh, very important for certain patients and cancer types, as well as duration of response obviously is incredibly important. So while you might not have increases in responses as you move through a dose range, you might have differences in these other efficacy measures that are incredibly important. So the new aspects to consider, I'll start with the, the top one here and move our way down because this is the most important one and it's definitely a, a lens of, you know, of the way that we think about oncology and dosing, uh, you know, the expectation to look at multiple doses and clinical trials uh, to evaluate activity and efficacy is definitely new to oncology, although not new to other therapeutic areas, it is new to oncology space. And so this is probably the first hurdle that we all need to get over. Um, in addition, you know, the agency really is expecting these PK, PD exposure response relationships to be established as well as submitted in regulatory packages and for dose justification. So not only do we need to collect the data, we need to analyze the data and we need to make time to analyze that data and use it to help our justification. Um, the next two bullets are going to be focused around toxicity. So uh, the new definitions, uh, while the DLT criteria have not changed, um, what the agency is asking us to do is to look at toxicity past the DLT criteria um, and look at dose intensity and adverse event time course on efficacy. Um, they also are looking at these, these toxicities that impact quality of life. So things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, those types of adverse events that will impact whether or not a patient chooses to stay on a therapy um, is something that is very important for us to have a better understanding of um, and not be so focused only on the grade three, four adverse events. Um, the agency is also suggesting and encouraging quality of assessments to be evaluated in early studies as well as those justification studies to get a better understanding of how these lower grade toxicities impact patient quality of life. And last but not least, integrated analyses are, are expected. So, you know, and as you go through your dose justification exercise, you know, to not forget about that non-clinical data and where your non-clinical thresholds were and what that data was telling you, and then linking it back to what you're seeing in the clinic, um, you know, the, the dose justification should be all encompassing of this information and it's not going to be driven just based on one thing anymore. And the very last thing that we have to consider uh, is the application of an optimal dose and, the, and taking that from one indication and moving it to another indication. Um, and this might be, um, you know, one cancer to another, uh, might be a monotherapy to a combo therapy, but the dose justification still needs to have some uh, bridging or paper argument or extrapolation done. Uh, we can't just assume that the dose that's approved is the one that is going to be the best dose for the rest of the uh, additional indications and combinations. 
So the impact and development, I think, is going to happen in a number of different ways. So um, in this slide, you know, because we are going to be sort of slowing down these earlier parts of drug development, which I call stage one and stage two, um, before we can actually get into efficacy studies, um, we will see a delay in some assets and their time to market um, because more patients are going to be needed to spend time in these expansion and dose finding stages to identify uh, not only active dose ranges, but optimal doses. Um, because we're gonna have an additional increased reliance on model informed drug development, you know, that is definitely going to increase time as well as cost. Um, and I think that, you know, in addition to slowing things down, the cost will go up because we need more patients and we need to do more things um, in order to get to the agency with the package that we need to justify our dose. So all of these things start to impact timelines, most definitely. And the very last one is that because we're going to have to have more regulatory touch points, or we are going to have to, um, you know, get, obtain agreement with the agency before we potentially move, um, you know, from our active dose range to our optimal dose study, and then from our optimal dose study to our efficacy study. Um, that every single time we have a touch point with the agency, inherently that's about a three to four month delay um, in progress as we wait for their feedback, we put together the meeting packages, et cetera. So all of these things, you know, in addition to just the, you know, the more work that's going to happen during development are definitely going to expand the time. And so we need to adjust our expectations as well as reset our expectations from a timeline perspective. So engaging with the FDA. So when do we go and what do we talk about? This is really important because if we don't have the data when we're engaging with the agency, um, the first time we're going to have to go back a second and a third and a fourth time to have those discussions with them. So ideally you have your standard meetings and you get what you need to out of those and you go off and you continue development. And um, so it's really important to make sure that you're engaging with the agency at the right time and that you have the right data package before you go in. So the pre-IND stage is relatively easy. No one usually has any data and that's totally fine. And the, you know, the discussions that you're having at that point in time is to obtain agreement on your approach um, and whether or not you are collecting the right data. Um, but by the time we get to end of phase one and end of phase two, you really need to have a relatively strong position to back up your arguments, because if you don't, the agency is likely going to send you back into development to get more data. Um, so for the, the minimum package for an end of phase one would be to have a patient somewhere between six to 10 per dose level. Um, we are going to be looking to obtain agreement on doses, dosages to evaluate further for efficacy and plan for those that dose optimization study. Um, so in order to do that, you really have to have good data to justify that range, which is means somewhere between six to 10 patients per level. Um, we would like to see some PK linearity. Uh, you would have to have a good understanding of your non-clinical and clinical PD activity across the dose range. And then of course, if you have an oral drug, you would ideally know your food effect and how what happens when you give food. Um, we need to have sufficient safety to understand tolerability and decent activity and efficacy to determine that low dose threshold. So you realize I don't say anything about the high dose threshold, but we really want to make sure that the low dose that we're going to evaluate further is active. We don't want to give inactive drugs to patients. By the time we get to end of phase two, we are looking to obtain agreement on the dosages to evaluate and registrational. So by this time, you need your full justification, including non-clinical pharmacokinetics, exposure response, efficacy, and safety. And this data should be coming from a dose optimization evaluation. The engagement with the FDA can occur at any time, um, and you know we can have our standard meetings, the type A, B, C, and D meetings. Um, you could also include a, a justification or a white paper like justification with protocol new and change submissions. And of course, there's the MIDD meetings for the the drugs that are using more sophisticated model informed approaches to help with their dose justification. Um, 
if you if you go into one of these critical milestone meetings, like the end of phase one or end of phase two meeting, um, or actually any standard meeting with the FDA, and you know you don't have enough data or your justification is poor, um, the likelihood that the FDA puts you on hold or keeps you from moving throughout development and makes you go back to get more data is definitely higher now than it has been in the past. So. It is something to consider, um, you know, talking about your clinical colleagues if you don't feel like you're quite ready for these milestone meetings to um, potentially hold back a bit to get more data. So from Sertara's standpoint, we have a number of different offerings that we, that we can um, use to help your company navigate these new uh, Project Optimus requirements. So the very first one would be an Optimus Fitness Evaluation, which is for assets that are in the earlier stages of development. And what we do here is evaluate non-clinical. We look at your first and human protocol. Um, I sort of... Um, you know, take all of those uh, terminologies out of the uh, protocols that we're all used to using to make sure that it is going to fit well with the FDA. Um, so removing things like, you know, the primary objective being identifying the maximum tolerated dose, like we really need to get away from those types of things in our first and human protocol. In addition, we can kind of start helping, we can help you plan for pharmacometrics analyses and activities. Um, and that might be thinking about cost or time as you want to incorporate these uh, um, for your data analysis as you choose your active dose range. By the time we actually have some clinical data, uh, we are at the Project Optimus Gap Analysis stage. Um, and that is typically going to require uh, enough data past the dose escalation or potentially after a dose optimization study is done and prior to the start of a registrational study. The gap analysis can easily also be done for new indications or new combinations. Um, and here we do a full assessment from non-clinical all the way to the safety and efficacy um, to see whether, you know, what is what your data is telling you and what your active dose range is or what the dose is for a registration. As part of the Project Optimus Gap Analysis, we can also fill out the FDA's um, dose optimization table that they've been sharing with people, um, and, and that can be part of the, the overall package there as well as to start building out that justification for you. We also can come give workshops and seminars, um, and those are typically directed towards your specific assets. Um, and what you're dealing with within your company's pipeline, whether it be immuno-oncology, small molecules, or combinations, um, we can retrofit a workshop on Optimus to kind of start the discussion as to how you're going to um, start to adapt your program to get this data. Um, we can also support ad boards, um, diligence. If you're thinking about in licensing an asset and you want to know what the potential risk is from a dose support, um, we are happy to do that and serve as KOLs very often for these activities. Um, and for the NDA and BLA assets, you know, these are assets that I consider to be in the Optimus transition. So there are assets that were uh, phase three studies were done or registrational studies were done before Optimus became uh, a reality. And so we are helping uh, review dose and risk um, and what you potentially would do in parallel to or after approval from a dose optimization perspective. Um, and of course, we're happy to support any FDA interactions as you move through these discussions. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, kind of, asking um, or putting to questions together or helping your team decide what to go, when to go, how to discuss, um, how to tell your story, right? And as simple as it sounds, it is of critical importance um, to make sure that you're telling a cohesive and um, on-point on story for your dose justification so that the FDA can digest it and hopefully agree to it. So our Project Optimus team is, uh, there's about nine of us, uh, clinical pharmacologists as well as pharmacometricians. Um, we have uh, two ex-FDA reviewers, I am one of them, um, and we have uh, another one coming uh, that, is go that is part of our Project Optimus team. Um, so it's right now, it's me and Krithika Shetty uh, that sort of lead up this, this group, and she brings the IO as well as a large molecule experience to the space and helps fill out that for the team. 
Um, entirely, most of our people within this team have about 20 years of oncology drug development experience for each of them. So they're very established um, scientists that have been in both biopharma as well as large pharma. And in 2022, we navigated at least 80 assets. So it was a very busy year um, helping those with project optimist needs. Um, so we definitely are seeing things from the agency and, you know, kind of have our finger on the pole, so to speak, of what's happening from an optimist base. So, again, very happy to help you with your, your asset, and, um, and I thank you for your attention, and I really do look forward to the panel discussion. So thank you very much for all of your attentions to join our sessions today for pediatrics and also on Project Optimus. So now we open our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please uh, submit to the Q&A. You can drop the questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. So uh, I have a question for Jilly. Um, so the question is, what are what are uh, some endpoints that FDA is using to determine optimal dose, and can we use PD endpoints? Yep. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, yes, this is a common question that we're getting. Um, I think that when I when I approach endpoints, I like to kind of put them in three different buckets. So uh, informative endpoints, uh, surrogate endpoints, and clinical benefit endpoints. And when we're thinking about dose and dose optimization, the endpoints that we would typically be looking at have a tendency to be more informative in nature in order to determine our active dose range, right? So potentially pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, PKPD relationship, safety, um, as well as uh, maybe early activity estimating sorts of endpoints. Um, those might be KI-67 or PSAs if you're thinking about um, uh, prostate cancer. But as we move into the like dose optimization exercises where we're actually looking at more than one dose level for efficacy, those endpoints need to be more in the surrogate bucket. So in that point in time, we would be thinking about response rates, durations of responses, time to response, minimal residual disease, complete response, major molecular response, those types of things is what we'd be looking at when we're like really, you know, taking two dose levels um, and expanding on that to get a, a signal for efficacy. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. I find that dynamics is, they fall into the informative bucket. Uh, unless you have a relationship with your dynamics to your efficacy, which is really hard to do. And um, most of us don't have a great relationship or we don't have a good understanding as to what level of dynamic movement we need to see, how long it needs to be moved, um, and whether or not it needs to stay there in order to obtain efficacy. So that's one of the uncertainties of using dynamics. I think it's a great marker to to know that you're hitting something and you're on target, but it's not necessarily going to correlate to efficacy in all instances. Thank you, Jilly. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a second question for myself. When will be the best time to start pediatric plan? So um, the advice is to start your pediatric plan or record its strategy early, preferably when you are actually start running your adult phase one trial and start to think about whether your compound is actually relevant, have the mode of action relevant to the pediatric populations. And if does so, then there would be mandatory um, requirement to have a pediatric investigation planned in order before you can apply for MAA. And also you will need to have a plan on your initial pediatric study plan for FDA because they would be expected to discuss with you in annual phase two. But in terms of like, as you heard from Julie, um, for biomarkers and also different types of endpoints, you need to think about the translatability of those endpoints. So that is why we need to decide early during your adult phase to kind of plan what kind of data, what kind of trial you want to um, 
uh, design it for children and maybe is not the same as the indication as the adult. So the earlier, the better, because a lot of the time we see a lot of example is people have delayed that overall um, development timeline due to the delayed in pediatrics. So I hope you answer the questions. And I've got another one for Julie. So does the FDA expect those optimization to be conducted for all indications and combinations? Um, it really depends. Um, the guidance was um, relatively uh, vague with regards to some of this information, but I think what I've been seeing is, you know, kind of like how actually this this does well with pediatrics. You know, we we have to go through an extrapolation exercise if we want to leverage the adult efficacy and safety into peds, right? It's not a given. It's something that has to be constructed and put together and backed by science and knowledge. That's a very similar exercise to what I'm expecting um, when we take an optimized dose from, say, breast and move it into colorectal cancers. Um, we can't just assume that we can do that. We actually have to put together some extrapolation exercise points to make the justification um, sound. And those have a tendency to revolve around making sure that there's no pharmacokinetic differences between the two patient populations. There's no differences in safety, as well as, um, you know, making sure that our target or, you know, what we're dosing for is present on both those types of tumors and those types of locations. So that can sometimes be the most difficult component, um, but it's not necessarily a given anymore. It just requires a little more paperwork. With regards to the combinations, um, dose optimization with combinations is something that's still evolving. There is a couple of workshops this year being held by the FDA and ASCO with regards to approaches to combination therapies. Um, I think that all I can really say on the topic in brief is that, you know, it definitely helps if you've optimized your dose for monotherapy. It will help streamline some of the combination um, approaches that you do, um, but it's not necessarily a given that your optimized monotherapy dose will be the optimal dose in combination because then again, that really goes down to the pharmacological reason for the combination. So if you're doing something that's synergistic, then you could potentially have some wiggle room in your actual dose that you've optimized with monotherapy as you move into combination settings. So again, we just have to step back and think about it a little bit, and it can't just be based solely on safety. Thank you, Julie. Um, I think to follow what you just said, maybe a question to both of us, can we extrapolate mm -hmm. safety? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think uh, for, for some instances, it makes sense, right? I think it depends on the toxicity, though, and in the oncology setting, it really depends on what potentially that patient might have seen in their previous lines of therapy. So. For example, there are some chemotherapies that patients might have seen in the first line or second line setting that can cause either neuropathies or renal impairment, right? So you can imagine that those patient groups would potentially be more susceptible to drugs that cause adverse events for neuropathies or renal impairment, unlike patients who may not have seen those chemotherapies in their first line setting. So, in some instances, you can extrapolate safety, but I think it really just depends on how, how much those prior lines of therapy across your populations match um, and whether or not all safety can be extrapolated or maybe just portions of your adverse event profile can be extrapolated. And yeah, I'll, totally. I'll let you talk about the PEDS point. So. <laughs> Definitely, but I totally agree with you on the oncology side. It really, for pediatric, also depending on the toxicity and the safety we're kind of focusing on. For example, if we not talk about pediatric, we were 
before a drug going into the clinic, we like for example for cardiac vascular safety, for CKLT, you can see some preclinical signal, but not every single one of the preclinical signal can be translated to human. The same as like whether from adults to be that as well, because depending on how young we are looking at the safety to be extrapolated to because some for pediatric there's still quite a lot of maturation ontogeny going on especially in the very young infant and neonates as well so we need to take into account of all the information that collect in the clinic and for specific indications okay hope it answered that general questions and then, so next one is for me is quite short. Um, if the prevalence of the disease is low and hard to recruit, could we waive the pediatric study? Yes, this is a very common uh, issues with um, a lot of the trial, not only in pediatrics, because especially on, also on rare disease as well in pediatric. But however, um, hard to recruit and the prevalence of the disease law is not a good justification to waive the pediatric study because you need to provide um, justification. For example, those patients actually do not exist, even though you have waited for years and years to open the trial to justify that we do not have the patient population to study. Um, if it's about recruitment, then it's not or Another way is if the trial is already opened, but then there is a sign of the recruitment is not going to be finished for years, maybe like the next 10, 15 years. Um, then it is a very good position to actually evaluate the data that you already obtained. And like Julie is nodding her head, like to actually engage to <laughs> the regulator early for scientific advice to re re we um, evaluate the data that you have, whether it's sufficient to provide the dose justification or commitments that you have put a point in your plan, uh, for example, like PEPT or IPSP as well. But early dialogue and review of the data would be good because at that point you might be able to um, have a modifications of your commitments in your plan and then change it. But then again, if you have planned it early, then you have sufficient time to do that. Okay, and then we got, oh, we got another question. Do all the drugs like uh, ADCs needs to have those optimization exercise? Yeah, so this is a quick one, um, and I know we're almost out of time. So yeah, the short answer is basically, I feel the FDA did do, they provided a list of drugs that are applicable underneath the dose optimization guidance, um, but it's, it needs a little bit more uh, clarity as well. Um, however, I think it's safe to assume that drugs that are evaluated under the CEDAR umbrella, not the CBER umbrella, would definitely be subject to optimist requirements. So that means ADCs, cytotoxic bispecifics, biologic, small molecule TKIs would all um, be considered there. Uh, there were caveats for vaccines as well as radiopharmaceuticals, but we needed a little more clarity in the guidance so comments were submitted um, to provide that. So thank you for the questions, Amy. Yep, thank you, Julie. 